Okay. So hello everyone and welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of the 3rd of February 2022. So unfortunately, Hadi could not make it today and that's why I'm here. So my name is Mark Schoen. I'm a colleague of Hadi at TU Delft and together with Sebastian Geiger from Harriet Watt, I have the pleasure to co-host today's webinar. So we are delighted to host Alka Barnhorn from TU Delft as our distinguished speaker. Alka Barnhorn is an Associate Professor of Applied Geophysics and Petrophysics at the Department of Geoscience and Engineering at TU Delft. His main research interests are rock physics and rock mechanics and fracture network development. He uses experimental facilities in Delft to study the anisotropic properties of rocks, combining geomechanical and acoustic measurements and 3D imaging of the rock structures. His research has applications in geothermal energy, CO2 storage and induced seismicity. So Auke is educated at Utrecht University, where he holds a master's in geology, and at ETH Zurich, where he received his PhD. So after his PhD, he had a postdoc position at the Australian National University in Canberra, as well as in Utrecht University. So thank you, Auke, for graciously accepting our invitation. And to the audience, please note that this lecture will last for about 30 minutes, followed by questions. And please type your questions in the chat box and Sebastian will take them after the lecture. So please do not wait till the end of the lecture to post your questions, but just type them whenever you feel appropriate as they may trigger other questions by other participants. So Auke, uh, we're all very much looking forward to hearing your lecture. So please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marcia. Thank you for your nice introduction and inviting me to give this uh, this seminar on YouTube. This seminar will be uh, I will show the research that I and uh, the postdocs and PhD students in my group have been doing for the last couple of years on trying to see whether we can forecast failure and seismicity in in the laboratory. So we do experiments in the laboratory where we bring rocks to failure and try to use geophysical techniques uh, to forecast the failure of the material. So can we somehow see failure coming before it happens? So I'm happy to introduce uh, this topic to you in this, uh, in this next lecture of half an hour. So why do I want to do that? Now, I think that's it's important that we are able to somehow uh, forecast uh, processes in the earth and we do that in all kinds of different ways but one of the most difficult ones probably is is predicting seismicity earthquakes predicting forecasting failures of structures and primarily because it's so it's 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 often seen as things that happen instantaneously and that if we are able to do so then it would, of course that would be very nice uh, to 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 be able to forecast uh, before it happens and that's important for a whole lot of different applications. Uh, you can think about uh, civil engineering structures that are, are failing. Uh, you see here a, a parking garage uh, that, that has somehow uh, collapsed. Uh, and in the bottom, you see the bridge in, the, uh, in Italy, uh, where, where, which collapsed a, a couple of years ago. And then in hindsight, they actually realized that they could have somehow seen that in from satellite data. If they, if they would have looked better, they could have seen that things we're going to come going or coming close to uh, to maybe failure so they uh, they had to be able to they could have been able to predict that maybe for in the beginning now and then you can think about uh, um, mine stability and there's often an issue in 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 mines that they are afraid when they're they're creating those additional tunnels eh, for for mining that they might uh, uh, and you uh, make stress changes in 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 the tunnels uh, setting uh, that might might then trigger instability and uh, the miners often hear like seismicity and they they are afraid of it so are there ways to to predict and forecast and, and then of course if you're able to do so maybe prevent it from happening now and then the last picture you see on the on the right hand side at the bottom is, is the well-known seismicity issue in, in Groningen where due to prolonged gas production in the Groningen gas field in the Netherlands, they uh, they create they caused a compaction of the reservoir, compaction of the reservoir again, triggered uh, local changes in the stress field and that created the earthquakes from happening. And there has been a large research program in the Netherlands since a couple of years on, on the Groningen gas field, uh, 
including universities in the Netherlands from Delft, Utrecht, but also Amsterdam, Eindhoven, and Enschede. Uh, so all the, all the Dutch universities in the Netherlands are now working on that problem and attacking, let's say, this seismicity issue from different directions. And in that project, two of the PhD students of TU Delft, these are Aukje and Milat, both of them are PhD students working in the laboratory with me on rocks that are similar to the Groningen sandstone reservoir rocks where we do experiments and try to see whether we can maybe forecast seismicity and failure or sorry or maybe if we are are having seismicity and failure can we somehow influence that now and that's of course important if we want to somehow in future stop maybe on time with the uh, production or, or extraction of gas or maybe uh, pressurization of a reservoir can we somehow stop that uh, stop that production change the production alter the production maybe in rate or in pressures so that we can minimize the risk of, of seismicity what do those two phd students do uh, they have different topics the phd project of aukje is uh, the one that i will present today is, is where we try to use acoustic measurement techniques in the laboratory laboratory to uh, to forecast failure breaking of rock samples and thereby forecasting the seismicity milat does something slightly different uh, he plays with injection pressures injection rates cycling of inject of of, of uh, fluid pressures to see can we somehow influence the seismicity that we produce uh, can we maybe make uh, make less large magnitude events and maybe a little bit more small magnitude seismic events something like that can we design protocols to influence and minimize the seismicity it's important to say hey we do that in the laboratory yeah? we are not doing this kind of stuff in the field yet and maybe that would be something we could do in the future this is just laboratory research where we break rocks and see whether we can design monitoring techniques to maybe forecast failure or or injection protocols to influence the seismicity. Some of you, I hope many of you have been at the geoscience and geoenergy uh, webinar series of last week. Last week, Ian Main, who is a professor of the, the University of Edinburgh, uh, gave a very interesting and I thought very well illustrated lecture showing what kind of processes are happening in rocks while you bring them to failure. Uh, he showed very clearly that all kinds of progressive um, processes are acting, are happening before the material fails. He used micro tomography imaging, so he imaged the samples in 3D while he was uh, stressing the samples, and he showed that uh, very nicely uh, that there are all kinds of complex processes happening that bring a rock or lead to failure of the rock. And so. Let's, uh, if, if you have not seen that, uh, watch that video on, on YouTube. It's, it's, it's a very nice lecture showing uh, progressive behavior of rocks. And exactly that is what I am trying to uh, study with my active acoustic monitoring technique. So, so we use geophysical techniques to exactly follow that progressive failure of rocks. Can we link the progressive failure of rocks to changes in uh geophysical let's say attributes so that you can start forecasting the failure so it's a very nice let's say jump from the lecture from last uh, week i think to the lecture of today and he showed and i that is also very well known uh, in in literature had uh, that there are all kinds of processes active when you stress a rock uh, when you bring rock you put rock under under a load or under a force uh, you first have a period where the rock where all the existing pores, existing fractures, existing cracks are closing at relatively low stresses. At, at, there's a period when the rock behaves elastically. And then after you have, let's say, surpassed the stress of the, let's say, the elastic limit, you start to form new fractures. Those new fractures start to link up. They start to grow, they link up. And then at some point, the rock really fails, it catastrophically fails. And so it's that process of crack closure, elastic deformation, stable and unstable crack growth leading to catastrophic failure of a rock that we are interested in in the, in the monitoring approach of this research. And that's for material that is 
initially intact and you create new fractures on time scales that we study in the lab in the laboratory we see that that creation process is not instantaneous and therefore we use our monitoring techniques to uh, to sense that to follow that that's for intact rocks where you create new fractures but the same can be said for rocks that already have a fracture network in there or a fault network and you reactivate the rocks that are also a lot of experimental studies that show that the reactivation process also is not time or is not instantane instantaneous there is a time dependent behavior in there that leads at, at some point with more and more stress buildup leads to failure and so also there if you reactivate existing fault networks or fracture networks you you uh, you might be able to follow them with your monitoring technique and that it, it's that what we do we we try to sense those progressive processes that lead to failure that lead to seismicity with our active acoustic monitoring approach and that is uh, if you think about seismics or seismic uh, waves that travel through a rock body uh, the velocity of a seismic wave is influenced by what kind of minerals you have in the system. Eh? The, uh, the seismic wave travels at a different speed if you're uh, to a quartz ridge rock in compared to comparison with a limestone ridge rock, for example. Also, fluid content influences the uh, the velocity as well as the rock structure and the conditions that you do your experiments. Eh? So, how fast a wave travels through a rock is it depends on a lot of different things. And also how easy it, how easy the wave travels through it, huh? how large the amplitude of the seismic wave is depends on rock properties, fluid properties, rock structure and conditions. And you can, you can, for example, realize if you have a very, very porous rock and uh, your wave attenuates, damps, uh, the amplitude of, of the wave damps very quickly in comparison to a rock that has a very little amount of porosity. So there's a lot of things that control uh, seismic waveforms and seismic velocities for, for rocks. But also, if you think about that, if you are over time, maybe uh, substitute a fluid in, inside of a rock body. Yeah? So you have a rock that consists uh, at the start of your observation of pure 100% uh, brine and you pump CO2 into that into that rock, for example, that might influence your velocity and your seismic waveform. The same would be if if if, if reactions occur. Think about limestones, where you uh, where uh, a fluid uh, creates a reaction, and the reaction product is precipitates in the in the pores of the of the of the rock, and that might influence the seismic velocity as well as the waveforms. Deformation does the same. If your rock is decompacting your velocities might increase and your seismic amplitudes might also increase. And the same would be by closure or creation of fractures over time that might change the velocities and the amplitudes of the seismic wave that, you, that travel through that. And it's that changes in, in velocity and changes in waveform over time that we use in the laboratory to monitor the failure of the material. So what do we do in the lab? Uh, we have a, a rock sample that we put under stress. And then on either end of the sample, we place different transducers. Uh, we have a uh, source at one side of the sample, which emits the seismic signal. And then you have the receiver on the other edge of the sample that records the seismic signal. And we send a seismic wave every couple of seconds to the rock. And we always send exactly the same wave through the material. So from beginning to the end of the experiment, we send continuously the same wave with the same frequency, with the same amplitude through the rock body. If we do that continuously, sending the same wave, it means that any change in either arrival time of the wave or amplitude of the wave that uh, at, the, at the, let's say, the receiver end of your, of your sample must be because you have a change in the properties of the material that the wave is sent through. You send the same wave, but you record something different. And, sorry. It means that you have a change in your rock structure. And that change in the, the properties of the wave, we can, we 
mainly quantify that with different in different waves. Yeah? We look at the delay time or the velocity change of the wave. We look at the amplitude change of the wave, and we look at the scattering, let's say, characteristics of the wave. Yeah? A seismic wave that travels through a rock might go from source to the receiver directly, as as possible. You could say it's the shortest path that the wave traveled to, but the seismic wave might also scatter through the rock multiple times and then only arrives at the at the receiver. And that scattering change of the wave, that might say a lot about if, you, for example, form fractures in there and the wave has traveled multiple times through the fracture, you have a lot of scattering created that, that you can then start quantifying. And we quantify those scattering changes quite simply by the decorrelation coefficient and decorrelation coefficient is how is basically tells you how different the wave is that we sent at this moment to the wave that we sent maybe 10 seconds later or five seconds later if the wave that you send now is exactly the same as the wave that you send that you will send five five seconds later it means that decorrelation or the waves are exactly the same so the wave perfectly correlates or there's no decorrelation of of the two waves very exactly the same pattern means there's no decorrelation if the wave is significantly different five seconds later than the wave that sent five seconds earlier and then there's a high amount of decorrelation between the two waves so a high amount of decorrelation means there's a lot of change in the properties of the rock in between those two time intervals so the bigger the decorrelation, the larger the change in properties of the scattering of the wave you have. Now, and that it turns out to be a very powerful tool to, to see progressive changes of, of the material properties leading towards failure. I, I see here an example or two, one example of, a, of a, the first set of uh, experiments where we've done here, where we, where you, we have sent sick, continuously seismic wave through the material and then you can see for example it's it's not a lot but you clearly see that the wave uh, comes in earlier and earlier over time especially in the beginning of the experiments yeah? so the waves clearly has uh, the, the seismic velocity clearly has increased in let's say the first 10 measurement points and then it's kind of a stable value and if you would analyze this in detail, you would in this region, and so the later region, you would see that the seismic of the amplitude of the first first arriving wave is starting to drop down. And so there's some change in properties there. Now, we did some preliminary, preliminary experiments uh, over the last couple of years on all kinds of different rock types at quite, uh, say, non, non, let's say, non-realistic conditions yet. Uh, so typically we didn't put any, any fluid pressure in the sample. We did dry experiments at, at, at uh, no confining pressure on the sample. And we, we, we monitored the velocity changes. We monitored the uh, amplitude changes of the wave over time and saw that often you can use these analysis to to forecast that failure is happening. Uh, but we did that in preliminary, preliminary experiments at, at not yet realistic conditions. Now, in the DeepNL project brings that to more realistic conditions uh, where we put, where we use uh, samples that are put under a confining pressure that are wet. Uh, we put a fluid in there at a fluid pressure and, uh, and, and then we start to measure. Uh, so we start to mimic, let's say, real uh, subsurface uh, conditions and we did that at conditions that for example are representative for the uh, for the Groningen gas field as well and we did that both on samples that have are originally intact and samples that have originally or of like i have a pre-existing fault structure in there that we start to reactivate and we do that those two experiments and in both of those experiments we can show uh, that you can uh, see the failure coming uh, by analyzing the properties of the waves that we uh, the, that we record today i will first show you a couple of slides of the in experiments where we fracture intact samples and then afterwards i show a couple of slides with data where we 
reactive, reactivate the pre-existing fault uh, by, uh, so we have react, we re-slide along this fault and then uh, uh, measure the, uh, the acoustic properties of the material. Uh, so first of all, we do the intact samples. This is how the setup looks like. You have a, a simple system where you put your rock sample that is roughly seven centimeters in length and three centimeters in diameter inside of a, a little vessel, a pressure vessel, in which we can, let's say, uh, put a confining pressure on the medium. We have two pistons on top and on bottom that uh, put an axial stress on the sample. And then we have a pore fluid line also into the, let's say, the, the porosity of the sample. So you can also apply a pore pressure. So a confining pressure, a pore pressure, and a vertical axial pressure. And then we have two sensors, two, two transducers in the top and bottom piston of the sample that send the acoustic wave uh, continuously. So every three or every 10 seconds, we send an acoustic wave to the material. In our setup, we have a source at the top of the sample and a receiver at the bottom of the sample, but you could, of course, just as well turn it around. And then we do that every send the same seismic wave through the material every 10 seconds and then analyze the, the, the changes in the properties of the wave that we record at the, at the receiver end of the sample. Now, here you see an ex the data of the experiment where we have analyzed all the seismic waves and we plotted them for three different experiments done at three different confining pressures of 100 bars, 200 bars, and 400 bars. So these are the experiments of Aukje Feldmeier, uh, which she's currently writing up in a paper where she shows that, for example, for the 100 bar experiment, and that's the blacker line here at the bottom, you see a period where you have kind of a uh, uh, compaction and, and closure of pre existing fractures and cracks. Then you have a period where you have elastic deformation. You start to form your first cracks, uh, the stable crack growth regime leading to more and more fractures. And then this is the failure of the sample. And then in the lab, you, you clearly see and hear uh, that catastrophic failure of the sample at that point. If you look at all the seismic waves that are sent through the sample and you look at the change in the velocity of the seismic wave through the experiment, you see in all of those experiments that you first have a period where your velocity starts to increase, plateau at some point, and then start to drop again. Yeah, so the velocity gets slower again in, with comparison to, let's say, the velocity at the beginning of the experiment. And if you then see that for, you see that, let's say, going up, plateauing and going down for both the 100, 200, and 400 bar experiment. And if you see where that, let's say, top point is, is somewhere in the region. And so the maximum is somewhere in the region where you're, you go from your kind of elastic deformation to your creation of your first little fractures, more and more fractures. And so you can clearly see from the velocity measurements that point from elastic deformation to the stable crack growth regime. And that is for all three pressures and for all the repeat experiments that we have done, you see kind of the same behavior. So this is already a good indicator of the start of fracturing in our samples. And that's the changes in velocity. And then we also looked at the decorrelation coefficient. And remember how similar the seismic wave is from measurement one to the next measurement. And then you can also see a, a consistent pattern in the data. In the beginning of the experiment at low stress conditions, you always have a a lowering of the decorrelation coefficient. And so that means that the seismic waves become more and more similar to each other from measurement, from the measurement at this moment, moment to the measurement a couple of seconds later. And so lower values, the, way the seismic waves become similar and similar to each other. Then you have a whole period of, let's say, very low decorrelation coefficients. And so that means there is not a lot of change in the seismic waves. And at the moment, your stable crack crow starts to come, and your first new fractures start to form, that decorrelation coefficient goes up again. Yep. That's for the green data. It's 
kind of corresponds for the blue data and also for the orange data for the 400 bar experiment, you see the same kind of pattern. So you have lowering, stable, and then an increase in decorrelation coefficient again, which you can link very well again to the changes from elastic to non-elastic deformation. If you combine two, these two data sets with each other, or these two, let's say, proxies of the seismic data, and then uh, this is for one of the experiments. Have you, I only show now the 200 bar experiment with your stress strain curve, your decorrelation coefficient, and your velocity change over time. And you can start to say, or you could make an argument that uh, in, in the beginning of the experiment, my velocity goes up and my decorrelation coefficient goes down, then you have a period where my decorrelation coefficient is kind of stable. But in that regime, my velocity start also already starts to go down. But at the moment, your decorrelation coefficient goes up and your velocity is still going down. And that is when you get quite close to failure of your cycle. So in, if you put that in some kind of a, uh, like, Am I in danger setting or a traffic light system? And you could say if you are a period where your velocity goes up, uh, your seismic velocity goes up, that means you are far away from failure. In a period where your seismic velocity starts to go down, but your and your decorrelation coefficient is, is still stable, and that might be a regime where it is not that far yet or not that close to failure, but you're getting closer and closer to failure. But at the period where you have a decorrelation coefficient going up and at the same time your velocity going down, uh, that's the region uh, when you get very close to failure. So that might be also be the region where you say, OK, now now I need to stop my operation and I need to do something else uh, because now all these seismic indicators point me to being quite close to failure. Now, and that moment where your curve starts to go from basically orange to red, or in this, this diagram, it's more yellow to red, uh, is, is still in that still in that region, you still have a significant increase in pressure uh, that you need to go from, let's say, this point, where you're the first indicator that you get close to failure, to, you re to really having failure. And in all the experiments that we have done, we are something like between 60 to 70, or 55 to 75 percent of the stress strain curve uh, at 55 to 75 percent uh, there that's where your failure starts to be notified uh, you see so see that quite early in your in your data already and you still need something like 15 to 30 megapascal increase in pressure to go from uh, that point the beginning of the red zone to the moment that you feel failure so for intact experiments, right, my conclusion is that you can quite early see from the seismic data, so from the seismic waveforms that your sample is about to fail. And you still have a, quite a significant stress increase needed before it really happens. So that's for the intact experiments. For the experiments where you have a reactivation of the fault, it's a little bit less clear. It is still, you can still see it, but not so early. And also not with the uh, velocity change. Uh, the velocity change doesn't show much of a precursor to failure. Huh? So not, not a lot of forecasting. But the decorrelation coefficient does show, show that. Not as early as in the intact experiment, but you can still see it. And that's what I will show in the next, uh, next slides. What do we do in the experiments? Uh, we have a sample that we bring first to reservoir pressures. So we use our sandstone samples. We go to 330 bars of, of confining pressure. We pump in a fluid into the system. We make and, and so we go basically to high, uh, high reservoir pressure conditions. Then we start to increase vertically the stress on the sample to a point that we are very close to failure. And so we know if we would push a little bit further, we would have failure of our sample. And then if we have reached that point, so we are close to failure, we start to increase our pore pressure in the system. And we do that in this, in this experiment, we did that in steps. So the, or the pink curve is the pore pressure increase. Over time, you see we do that in steps going up in, in, in pore pressure. 
and then F, and then we monitor or we measure the stress change in blue as well as the the slip velocity change of the sample and so how much of a shortening or strain or reactivation or slip along the fault you have and then you can see that in every pore pressure increase period you have a moment where you have a very high slip velocity and so that's that where the green let's say uh, spikes are is where the your fault is being reactivated so in this experiment we have reactivated the fault five times yeah now the green curves shows you the reactivation moments in the system and then you can see that you reactivate the fault uh, five times and you get and you the reactivation is earlier and earlier in your pore pressure increase yeah? so the, the reactivation occurred every time occurred a little bit earlier than before and that's probably mainly because of the more and more lubrication of the fault you have during repeated reactivation of the fault system so this is basically the mechanical data and if you now look at the decorrelation coefficient or uh, of, of the seismic wave forms uh, so how similar is a seismic wave at this moment to a seismic wave that is recorded 10 seconds later you can see that at the points where you had those five little slip events you also have the largest decorrelation of the curve uh, so basically that means that slipping of the fault, a reactivation of the fault is is accompanied by a large decorrelation, so a large change in the waveforms uh, from one moment to the next moment, which is of course logical uh, because that's the moment that the reactivation moment so is also the moment that the material properties are changing. Uh, your your material structure is changing at that moment, so it's logical that that correlation is there. If we now zoom in on on this this one. Uh, so the the second slip event in the sample and we look a little bit more in detail and then we plot both the green slip velocity curve together with the decorrelation coefficient curve in red uh, in the diagram and then you have your pore pressure increase in in pink again there and then you can see that your slip velocity curve and your decorrelation curve in red have a a lot of correspondence with each other you see the same pattern coming back at the moment you have the biggest slip event you also have the largest decorrelation coefficient yeah, so you can use your seismic decorrelations to to predict or to forecast when you have your slip events if you look at a little bit more detail uh, then you could say in the moment that you don't have any pore pressure increase uh, your decorrelation coefficient is really low yeah. And then you start to pump in your uh, your fluid and you increase your pore fluid pressure and you start to see an increase in decorrelation coefficient. And then at some point the material starts to slip and then your decorrelation coefficient really starts to rise very quickly until the real failure, uh, the, 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 the real effect, uh, reactivation of the fault in your sample. And that is also the moment that the seismicity is sent into the uh, into the into the surrounding of the of, of the fault zone yeah, so that increase in decorrelation coefficient is uh, matches really well the first bits of the increase in slip or uh, slip velocity of your sample so the first moment of your reactivation and that first moment of the reactivation of the fault is often called the pre-seismic period and then uh, when you have the real reactivation is the co-seismic period so you could say if you start to see an increase in the decorrelation coefficient that goes more and more rapid, that's the moment when your sample starts to uh, be very close to uh, failure or very close to fault reactivation. And at the moment, you're, you have your main fault re reactivation, you have your post seismic period, then you see your slip velocity go down. At the same time, you see your decorrelation coefficient go down. Yeah, so it's a really nice one-to-one -one relation between the two. Uh, to data sets now and if you then start to see how that is uh, we looked at that one if you looked at the experiments where you have even more slip velocity uh, you can see that you have before the real slip you have uh, always a period where you see an increase in the decorrelation coefficient uh, that tells you that slip is about to happen now and how long is that in our experiments that moment uh, where you have see your first indication of 
the increase in decorrelation coefficient towards the moment that you are a failure and you still have in the experiment something like in our experimental time something like 20 to 25 seconds before you have your real fault reactivation in your sample and so there is a little bit of period in the experiment before uh, to 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 notify that uh, that that or forecast the failure to happen if you translate that to what kind of pore fluid pressure increase you will still have in that period is something like in most of the experiments between 5 and 10 megapascal and so remember from the experiments on the intact material we often have 15 to 30 megapascal increase uh, uh, still needed before failure in the fault reactivation experiments you see maybe one third or one uh, up to a half of the the stress increase or the fluid pressure increase before failure with respect to the uh, the intact experiment so it's a bit a bit less time but you still have a, a a period of forecasting before the real fault reactivation occurs so if you sum up the the results you can say in fracture in both fracturing of intact material and fault reactivation you have forecasting potential a little bit more let's say attributes of the waveforms you can see in the intact material there are a little bit more uh, guides or points uh, to, to look at to start to to forecast the failure for the intact material but you still see it also in the fault reactivation experiments and you have a little bit less forecast uh, potential in the fault reactivation but i think there's still still if you look at the details there's still a little bit of that now how important is that now and what this increase in pressure means in stress or pressure would mean if you think about real field scale conditions where you may play where you may have changes in the reservoir pressure the fluid pressure in your reservoir or the stress changes overall if you then start to compare that 15 megapascal change or uh, 8 megapascal change is that now still significant if you think about field scale conditions now if you look at maybe the large scale pressure depletion in the Groningen field eh, over the last 50 years, roughly uh, from the beginning to, of production to, uh, to the moment it's now, you might have, sorry, overall something like 25 megapascal of fluid pressure reduction eh, over a very long period of time. So if you think about that in terms of pressure degrees per year it's it's and that's here the bottom graph it's always been below one megapascal of pressure depletion over uh, per year so it's, so it's actually quite quite low in comparison to our let's say my my forecasting potential what i just showed if you think about eight megapascal it would mean that the system would have a couple of years of, of, of let's say, pre-failure eh, that you might be able to see in, in our data, eh, in this in the seismic data. Under the assumption, of course, that the processes and me mechanisms of in, in the field are the same as we have in the uh, lab and our forecasting techniques of the, of the or monitoring techniques also have the same sensitivity and potential as as you would have in the experiment and that's of course a question we we still have to answer now this is relatively slow depletion and you can also do that quicker where you if you take an example of the uh, the storage of gas in one of the uh, gas reservoirs in the netherlands where they use it as a as a basically the the gas field as a, a storage unit where they pump in uh, gas in summer and they produce more in the colder winter. And so there's a fluctuation in the, pore, the fluid pressure in the reservoir. That fluctuation in pressure is something like five megapascal at maximum per year. And so there's between summer and winter. If you think about that five megapascal, that is still in the same range as our eight, mega, five to 10 megapascal of the fault reactivation. So also there you might be in the same, same let's say, range for forecasting so if our experimental data can be translated similarly to our reservoir skills in terms of mechanism processes then i conclude that we might have some potential of our forecasting technique that i've shown you today that requires the same mechanism and of course uh, a, a monitoring technique that sees those differences in 
in in properties of the rock on a on a much larger scale then you can use the decorrelation coefficient in the same way as i've done in the lab also in, in field scale conditions and the last slide i will show is how we will do that for the the remainder of the deep nl project uh, we are we have done that now on the small scale experiments and we want to upscale that a little bit more to a larger scale and so we will do experiments on 30 centimeter big blocks where we really start to reduce the fluid pressure in one end of the reservoir while maintaining the fluid pressure on the other end of the reservoir we hope to have reactivation of the fault and then with our acoustic techniques we want to see if we can at, at a little bit larger scale still have that sensitivity and then we will use some upscaling techniques in uh, in in terms of seismic frequency and and fracture dimensions uh, but that's more of a modeling techniques to see if that 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 forecasting potential that we see in the lab for fault reactivation would also work maybe on a meter scale tens of meter scale and would even be better if you can use the same kind of techniques on a hundred meter scale and we will try to see where maybe the limit of this this technique is can we go to large such large scale or do we need to or is that not possible because the sensitivity is then is then lost now and then in in future that might be implemented in it would be ideal if you can start to imp implement it in subsurface conditions or maybe in in mining operations or a, a failure monitoring of bridges or structures depending on uh, to what uh, range of sensitivities we can use this forecasting system for i would like to end my presentation with this and i'm happy to answer any questions that you have <laughs> So thank you very much, Alka, for this very nice and very clear presentation. I think there are several questions coming in. So Sebastian, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much also from, from my side for a really nice presentation and a great continuation of last week's talk on how we break rocks and why we need to, to break rocks. Um, yeah, plenty of questions. We start oh, with one good. of our very regular viewers. Um, Yuang Wang asks, hi, Auke, thanks for the very interesting talk. Could you comment on what way simulation can help experiments to be conducted more meaningfully or perhaps more um, and, effectively? Uh, I presume uh, Yuang means the, the simulations I, I want to do or, or numerical simulations of maybe uh, uh, flow or stress build or for mechanical simulations. I think in, in if we are able to uh, link changes in the rock structure had uh, to on, on, on a on a on a on a fault scale had uh, to to uh, to seismic to to size active seismic wave that they travel to and uh, then you could maybe start to to uh to model this forecasting potential in 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 a detailed way if people like if you would be able to model the the experiments that uh, Ian Main last week showed, uh, and 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 then link that to seismic wave propagation modeling, and then you would be able to, to have more predictive power in there. What I would like to do in the in 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 my modeling approach of the second part of the of the of the PhD project in Aoki is uh, if we stay start to say we upscale this, and uh, we have done this experiment now at the eight centimeter scale, you, we make the system one meter. And we start to use seismic frequencies that are more realistic for a one meter, uh, let's say, um, uh, in act active settings. Are uh, do they still then because then the wavelengths start to increase and they can you still pick up those sensitivities and when start do you start to lose them? So these are I think two different approaches. Thank you. And you, you just talked about scales there, so um, really mean ask about that very fact so thank you for the very nice talk Alka. does the scale of your experiments have an influence on the results would a bigger smaller rock sample help understanding the processes better the scale of the experiment has a practical point as the, the going to a larger scale makes the experiment a hell of a lot more complex right? because the rock sample starts to increase I think what is also important is if you scale up your experiments, you also need to scale up your seismic wave, your, the frequencies of your seismic waves. Otherwise, the wave is not able to travel through that larger rock sample. And that increase in seismic frequency or decrease, increase in wavelengths or decrease in frequency also decreases the sensitivity to small changes in your rock sample. And so at some point, it might mean that your 
wavelengths come, become so large that your your changes in the rock structure are not picked up anymore. If your fault, then if the if the dimensions of your fault system starts to increase, yeah, and you have maybe more points where you have changed uh, fault reactivation, then then you might start start to pick them up again. So it does influence. Yeah. We do those small experiments because it's no, yeah, it's already difficult. Huh? But go too large is 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 becomes increasingly more difficult to do so. It's very nonlinear relationship more difficult, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, John Dudley, so staying on the experimental side, John Dudley asks, thank you for the interesting work. Have you investigated pore pressure increase rate, so the rate at which you increase the pore pressure and its impact on fault reactivation? We have we do experiments at different rates. It's all, always, of course, you, know, you could say lab, lab rates, you know, lab scale rates. So, so uh, but we see that the reactivation certainly uh, you can you can influence the the, the, the slip velocities uh, by, by 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 changes in in, in rates of pore pressure increase uh, so far in the experimental range i don't think we have seen a lot of sensitivity on the uh, on the active acoustic waves that we have sent through the materials but we see in terms of let's say mechanics we see a uh, effect of the rates and in the experiments where we measured and that's what milat did uh, does in his uh, phd project where we see uh, where we try to see how we, whether we can influence or minimize the seismicity, you you also see difference with the different rates in terms of the large magnitude events versus small magnitudes. I'm going to there are a lot of other um, questions, but I want to put sneak in one of my own questions here. So you, you talked about the challenges of doing these complex experiments at the lab scale, and and because you're at a small scale, some of the results are not not direct look for the right word here yeah, perhaps not directly applicable or translatable to the reservoir scale you talked about honing and which has a much longer time scale yeah. of building up or pressure depletion compared to what you do in the, in the laboratory so, so the results at one-to-one -one transferable considering all the other uncertainties do you have any feeling considering all the other uncertainties that we have in the subsurface permeability distributions to distributions of the rock properties, the mechanical strength, flow rates, etc. Where is this uncertainty of how you translate your lab experiments to the field scale rank cons um, compared to all the other uncertainties that we, that we have? And we, if you try to predict what is happening in the subsurface. I think the the, the uncertainties of the processes are, are large, of course. And I think what yeah. the what the big, what to me the big advantage of this active acoustics is, is that you control a lot yourself. You can you can determine yourself what type of waves you wave you send through the material, what 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 frequency, what amplitude. And so so you have control. If you do active monitoring, you have control on the on on what you send in, and and there's also what you record. Whereas if you start to to only record, for example, the seismicity, you're dependent on where it happens. Mm -hmm. And, and and what the magnitude is so you're basically only record the response of the earth and you're not you're not in you're not sending it yourself uh the it and 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 maybe the technique is if you assume there are changes happening and you should be able to pick them up and so it, it it's not necessarily that you need to know exactly what the what the permeability the porosity or the mechanical strength is you monitor over time so that means you any changes that you see over time has to do with something that is changing in the reservoir, even if you don't know what change is occurring yeah. there. That's so fair. that might help also there. Great, thank you. Back to our um, to our audience. So Alex Novikov has a question. I think it's over two or three comments. It's a little bit of a lengthy question, so bear with me. Um, just thank you, Aoka, for. A nice talk. From your talk, I found that the interpretation of experiments relies on the analysis of decorrelation coefficients. And my question sure. is, how developed and robust are this or other methodologies to predict failure in the subsurface in the presence of many factors, heterogeneity, flow, nonlinear material response, and considering different scales, can you suggest some review papers on such acoustic interpretation techniques? There's a question about how reliable it is, considering other process uncertainties and some yeah, I think, look so, for literature. Yeah. 
So we're not to, to be clear. I don't think in this in this in, with this monitoring technique, we are not trying to to understand the the the, the mechanisms of failure. Yeah, that that's maybe something that Ian Main was showing last week, yeah, where where we try to look at this is just yeah, you could say is is can we monitor that changes with R and link the what we monitor to what happens in the in the, in the process. So there's not. Of course, we also try to find out what happens in the rocks by by looking at the microstructure, what kind of changes occur. But that's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not aimed at, at a better understanding of of the failure processes in there. It's 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 primarily aimed of can we use techniques to see those changes occur, and and I think there are lots of. Uh, literature review papers uh, that show what the effect of of changing rock properties are on on seismic properties there are, there are lots of people that wrote papers where they did experiments and looked at the changes in seismic velocity uh due to stress built up uh, due to reactions that occur uh, we have i don't think a lot of people have tried to link it to what happens or to, to a monitoring technique or so monitoring changes in, or failure of the material and anything on on the decorrelation is that something that can that's be used? used that's used extensively in seismic uh for uh, for the understanding of uh, of 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 seismicity and 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 to uh, to to seismic interferometry in in, in the subsurface so, so that's a technique that is very extensively used in the geophysics community uh not not that i know of at least in 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 exper in, in in a lot of experiments it's more of a, like a geophysical imaging yeah. technique that's where a lot of ehe talks are normally about yeah ours. exactly yeah yeah and we try to use that in in the laboratory um a question from edgar hernandez he asks what is the difference in fault reactivation between the sealing and non-sealing faults during depletion In, in terms of the faults reactivate due to stress changes in the yes, yeah, along, yeah. Along, along that fault zone. Eh? And, and so you yeah. need in a, in a ceiling fault structure, you might yeah. have a, a much quicker stress difference between one side of the fault and the other side of the fault. And that, that causes the reactivation. And then if the fault is very non-sealing, then the, fault, the stress local stress buildup needs to be by, for example, other uh, that uh, there are other layers on top on the bottom like in Groningen they say the the, the let's say the change from uh, the, the cap rock to the reservoir on the other side creates the, uh, the the stress stress concentrations that lead to the fault reactivation right so so in a mechanistic sense there is a difference between between the two and is there any impact of the material in the fault itself so the the fault gouge any clays that that you may have that have been smeared um, into the fault and hence create a seal in terms of fluid flow in, yeah. the, in the fault. Yeah, and, yeah. 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 And, then, and then and that if you have then a more clay smear along the fault over time because you continue to re reactivate and then your fault becomes more non uh, more sealing, sorry. And and that changes in the in the structure of the vault might influence the seismic wave that is that 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 goes yes. through the through the through those materials. So your if you over time over multiple reactivation events, you might see that your your seismic your active actively sent seismic wave is changing properties as well. Thank you. Um, back to a question from Yuang, uh, and he's asked: Do you have any plan to apply this technique to monitor monitor field scale system with faults or fractures? What would be the main challenge? And one of the obvious questions is: Are you going to Use some of the techniques and for the um, deft art armor well yeah that's the so we we have tried to start to implement this on a on a bit large on a bit larger scale and then i mean maybe meter scale or something like that we've written i've written proposals yeah, to to do this for example for bridge structures in there so to use it in monitoring of failure in in bridges or uh, structures and then we try to also bring those bridge structures in an experiment ourselves to failure as so it would be cause failure of, of let's say a lab setting type of uh, field scale we have looked at using this in mines eh, also on a meter scale mm -hmm. on, an, uh, on an even larger in a subsurface scale i think that's a bit 
that might come in future. I know that companies are have, have seen interest there, but that needs, of course, a, a large investment to do so. I I hope that we in the in the in the geothermal well in our in our on our campus where we can use our active acoustic monitoring technique to sense whether we can see changes in the reservoir over time. And so it would be good to implement it there. So I have plans there. Yeah. It's really interesting. I, I've never thought about that. Yes, there's actually a lot in the building material, as you said, the bridges, et cetera, the mining side where you, that gives you probably this intermediate scale yeah. from yeah. centimeter to at least a meter, a couple of meters. Yeah, scale. and an in, intermediate scale is maybe doable for people like us, eh? like in, in right. this, this, uh, an increased lab setting almost. Eh? If you want to go on subsurface, you need to do it in wells at a couple of kilometers depth, eh? then it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a company operation you, know, you need to take. This is a really, I think yeah, we have time for one question here. Um, it's a really ignorant question from my side, not being a civil engineer. How much do civil engineers use actually um, seismic monitoring? Is that used at all to check that your bridges and and big um, structures are in in um, not compromised, or is that yeah. never? No, in, never yeah. done? In our faculty, there's in the engineering structures department of civil engineering, and there is a group of people that 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 basically, and we collaborate with them that they do similar things in in their structures. And so, I think traditionally a lot of monitoring in, in structures is is with strain and measurement of strains so or displacement or of uh, fatigue. Uh, they use techniques to see do I see fractures in our medium. Uh, they are now also, li like what I do in the lab, they are putting sensors in their system to continuously monitor. Mm -hmm. So they're, and they're building that into their, uh, into their workflow at the, at the moment, at least research wise and maybe also future in the future in, 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 in operations. That's really interesting. Yeah, I've never, never thought about that, that similarity uh, um, there. Um, I think that's in terms of all the questions. Thank you very much, Auke, for a really interesting talk. And I look forward to discussing some of the work that you do in much more detail um, person. And thank you to our audience for some great questions. And over to you, Marja, for announcing our next week's speaker. Yes. So thanks again, uh, Auke. That was really, really You're nice welcome. talk. So I would like to uh, take the chance to introduce our next week's speaker. Uh, so next week, we will host Eduardo Gildin from Texas A&M University, who will speak about model reduction as an enabler for digital twins in geosystem operations. So until next week, and as Hadi says, uh, stay happy, healthy, and tuned into our geoscience and geoenergy channel. So thank you very much and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.